OCO. Can everyone hear me? All right. OCO, everyone. I'm Catherine Foreman Gray, and this is Rory Crittenden. And we're here today. We're going to talk about, break down a little bit about the Going Snake tragedy. This is the 150th anniversary of the Going Snake tragedy, which happened the 15th of April in 1872. Sorry, we're getting a little bit of a late start. We had um, some technical difficulties, but I think we're all good now. So thank you all for joining us today. I know it's hot, and um, we have a little bit of breeze coming through here with some of the, um, the fans. So I want to thank um, all of you for being here today, and hope everyone's having a great holiday weekend. Um, I'll introduce myself a little bit and tell you a little bit about what I do, and then I'll turn it over to Rory so he can tell you a little bit about what he does. Um, I'm a history and preservation officer for Cherokee Nation. Um, I've worked for the tribe for about 10 years. I'm a University of Arkansas graduate. I'm a former park ranger from the Fort Smith National Historic Site, so that's kind of where I got my interest in learning about Cherokee outlaws and lawmen and um, kind of everything that goes along with that. So um, I'm ex I also serve on the board um, for the U.S. Marshals Museum in Fort Smith, so we're hoping that that will be completed by next year. Um, and so, yeah, I'm excited to be here today, and uh, Rory's a filmmaker, so I'm going to let him introduce himself and tell you a little bit about what he does. He has just as much uh, passion for this story as I do um, pertaining to Going Snake. Uh, hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Rory Crittenden. I'm a Cherokee filmmaker. I've uh, done quite a bit of documentary work, uh, some of it pertaining to Going Snake, but I don't think any of those projects have really come out uh, yet. Uh, I'm also kind of transitioning into some like narrative content. I wrote a pilot for a Cherokee Western called Going Snake, not dealing directly with this, but uh, my family comes from Peavine. It's in the Going Snake district, and uh, it's a story my dad always told me growing up, and uh, apparently he got a lot of things wrong after I started doing uh, research into it. And uh, a lot of people, it's, you know, a lot of, uh, it's an interesting story, and a lot of people come at it from different angles. Uh, Good to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so before we get started, I do want this to be a little bit um, interactive. You guys have questions, um, and Rory and I are really just going to have a discussion that breaks down um, this story. Are there any descendants, uh, Proctor descendants or um, Beck descendants, or anybody that's related to anybody that's invi or involved with the Going Snake? Usually I run into a lot of descendants, because there's a lot of them um, out there, so I always kind of like to you know, gauge the audience before we get started. Um, so yeah, we're gonna get started. A lot of people will ask, you wanna do the next slide? Um, I can kinda see this. But, um, so what was the, the tragedy at Going Snake? It actually has a couple of different names. Some people will call it the Proctor Beck feud. Um, it's, um, it's got a couple of different names. Um, the Going Snake massacre, some people will refer to it as. Um, but this was a, a standoff between, um, well, um, Zeke Proctor, who was a uh, Cherokee man who um, was on trial for killing a Cherokee woman. And so we'll get into the details here in just a little bit. But what happened really was the, um, uh, there was 11 people that were killed in a, uh, during a court case or during a court hearing that was being held over in Going Snake District of the Cherokee Nation. And um, marshals weren't supposed to be there. This was, this was a Cherokee trial. A Cherokee man was on trial for killing a Cherokee woman. And we'll get into the details here in just a minute about what, um, you know, how our, our courts and things like that worked. But that was, um, the marshals came in because they had a, a, a man by the name of James Kesterson who had went to Fort Smith and said that Zeke had tried to kill him. And so um, we'll get into a little bit about what it meant to be a political citizen of the Cherokee Nation in the um, 1800s as well. And so um, that's, that's really kind of what happens. There's a, there's a murder that happens and then they have a court, there's a, a trial that's going on and then the marshals show up and there was about, I think people say anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes that a gunfight ensued. Um, and you can go to the next slide. And Rory, jump in here sure. anytime. Um, so it is often cited as the largest um, military gunfight in the Old West. Um, the shootout claimed the lives of 11 men and wounded uh, many others. Um, and it's considered, it's considered the deadliest day in history for the U.S. Marshals Service. So if there's anything else, I don't know you want to add to that. Yeah, uh, the U.S. Marshals Museum in Fort Smith, if you go there, they have a big wall 
of all the marshals that have uh, fallen in the line of duty. And you can go there and see the Cherokee names because there were Cherokee people on the, uh, in the posse. So they counted as part of the uh, fallen for the marshals, the Becks, you know. Yeah, over at the Marshalls Museum, there's some, it's opening in phases right now, but there is a Hall of Honor that is um, there as well. And it's got all the lawmen um, for the U.S. Marshal Service that were killed in the line of duty. Um, they also will include, um, because Judge Parker's court or the Western District of Arkansas oversaw all of Indian Territory, so they also will include tribal lawmen who were also cross-deputized or posse members um, for, for the deputy marshals. So the events leading up to the fight, um, this depiction right here is, um, uh, was in the newspaper. It's um, the murder of um, Polly, uh, Mary Polly Beck Hildebrand Kesterson. Is that right? It sounds right. She had a lot of names. So um, she was a Cherokee woman that was um, originally um, a Beck. Uh, a lot of people will call her Polly, but her name was uh, Mary uh, Beck, and she uh, was married to a man named Stephen Hildebrand, and they lived um, in the northern part of, of Cherokee Nation. Uh, there was a, a mill um, called the, the Hildebrand Mill that Stephen had bought, and they were running that mill there. So when he died, uh, Polly, she hired a man by the name of James Kesterson, and then they later um, will get married, and um, Zeke had a, had a problem with this, and I don't know if you want to go into a little bit of detail on that. Uh, so, I, I, tell me when I'm wrong, because I don't have a degree, I'm a storyteller, filmmaker, so just jump right in and say, Roy, that's wrong. But uh, I think most people believe that uh, James was in a relationship with Zeke's sister, and, uh, and the going theory is that he kind of left her and their children high and dry, and moved in with Polly Beck and just kind of cut ties. And so you can imagine that'd be a sore spot for Zeke, you know. Oh yeah, so um, so Proctor's sister, Zeke Proctor's sister, Susan, who when you look at, she was actually only 17 years old when, when she died. She's buried up in Johnson Cemetery as well. But she um, had been with James Kesterson and apparently he uh, completely left her. They had moved down to the Canadian district um, but he left her and took up with um, this Polly Beck. And so Zeke, there's, a, there's numerous stories as to why Zeke shows up at the mill that day. Some people say that there had been stories about stealing cattle, um, just about the Proctors and Becks not liking each other. But I think most people have settled on that he was up there because he was upset with the way that Kesterson had treated his sister, um, Susan. And so he went up there to confront James Kesterson and um, that's when they got into a heated argument. Um, Zeke pulls his gun, and he's going to fire at James Kesterson, pulls the trigger, and then Polly jumps in front of, um, of James, and she's the one that ends up getting shot and killed that day. So we have a Cherokee man that has killed a Cherokee woman. And so, you can go to the next slide on this. I think I have. Yeah, so we have a Cherokee man that killed a Cherokee woman. And um, so we have our own courts. We have everything established here in the Cherokee Nation as far as um, you know any crimes that are committed, uh, Cherokee on Cherokee, those are going to be settled here in the Cherokee Nation courts. Um, however, it got a little bit tricky when um, there were uh, non-Indians involved. So for instance, if somebody comes and say it's 1872 and um, a Cherokee man comes and steals one of my horses or tries to and I shoot and kill the guy, I'm going to stand trial here in the Cherokee Nation. However, when it involved a non-Indian, that's when the Fort Smith courts would get involved. A lot of people get confused as to why this court in Fort Smith had jurisdiction over here in Indian Territory. So anytime there was a crime that was committed by or against a non-Indian, that's when Fort Smith would take over. However, James Kesterson, I want to point out here, because this is a very important part of the story, in the Treaty of 1866, um, there is Article 13, and I don't know if you can see some of this or, or read some of it, but down here it talks about um, cases arising within the, our country here in the Cherokee Nation in which members of the nation, and it also says by native adoption. 
And so that was something that was in the treaty. So James Kesterson had lived with Polly Beck here in the Cherokee Nation. Um, they were married. He was considered a citizen of the Cherokee Nation at that time. So he had to adhere to all of the rules, um, all of the laws here inside the Cherokee Nation. And so whenever Polly was killed, um, he ran to Fort Smith, and what he was trying to do was play both sides of this. He ran to Fort Smith, and he was trying to, um, he claimed that Zeke had assaulted him and tried to kill him. And so this is why the Fort Smith court gets involved at that time. Because if there were any crimes that were committed, once again, you know, if a, a non-Cherokee shows up and tries to steal one of my horses and I shoot and kill this guy, I then now have to go to Fort Smith and stand trial. So a lot of natives had a very negative view of the court then. Um, you know, today we have a jury of our peers. It's men, women, it's racially mixed. That was not the case back then. It was typically white men that would sit on the jury and, um, and decide the fate. So natives had a very negative view for going over to Fort Smith and standing trial. And, and there's also a difference in back then when you'd get married in the Cherokee Nation. It's a little different than getting married outside, like if, if you were in Arkansas Federal District, right? Uh, it was less formal. Uh, records weren't always like exactly finely kept. And so in Cherokee Nation, we would consider him a citizen because, back then because he had married a couple of Cherokee women. So he had been living and operating the Cherokee Nation for a long time. We considered him a citizen. And so in our view, he should have been tried in the Cherokee Nation. It was a Cherokee on Cherokee crime. But he ran to Fort Smith because he thought, yeah, and a lot of people say, so Polly was a Beck, and the Becks and the Proctors did not get along. That was well known. And so the Becks were the ones that encouraged Kesterson to go to Fort Smith and to seek uh, filing assault charges um, on Zeke Proctor. Go to the next slide. Let's see what we got here. So this is just, um, I do want to point out, so behind me is a photo of Judge Parker. Um, a lot of, I, I do want to point out that he was not the judge at this time. So prior to Parker um, going to Fort Smith, being appointed to the, the bench there in Fort Smith in 1875, we have a judge by the name of William Story. So he was a pretty corrupt judge. Um, he was forced to resign, but there was you know, bribery involved. They were making money. Um, I mean, the, there were lawyers involved. There was all kinds of, of politics involved in it. But um, William Story was, was forced to resign, but he was the, um, the judge at the time. And so when they, there should have never been a warrant, um, you know, sent out for, for Zeke. And so um, they were instructed that if Zeke was found um, not guilty, that's when they were supposed to arrest him and bring him to Fort Smith. And, and so the trial's already going on at this point, right? And they're instructed to, in the Cherokee Nation for Zeke killing Polly, and they're being instructed to only arrest him if he's found not guilty. And so who's uh, the, joining the posse are some of Polly's family members, right? Yes. Yeah. And so a lot of her, it's White Soot Beck. Uh, that's the name I remember. And uh, so it's a few of her cousins and things joining this posse that's going to go potentially pick him up. And so you call that a conflict of interest, right? Yeah, you should never put um, you know, family members of a victim on a posse to go and arrest somebody. So that right there was you know, the, the, first, um, you know, the first mistake that, that the court did. This right here is the arrest warrant for Zeke Proctor. Um, and then there's a couple of photos of him um, next to it as well. But yeah, there should have never been an arrest warrant. This was something that the federal court should have never been involved with because we have a Cherokee on Cherokee crime here in, in the Cherokee Nation. And so this map that's behind Rory a little bit, I hate that we can't see some of these. I thought we were gonna have a bigger screen. But um, this is a map that um, Dave Kennedy, who's the curator over at Fort Smith had put together. And so it kind of gives you a little bit of, um, if you can see it, I know it's a little bright, but. Um, kind of where the, how far it was to, to travel to Going Snake from Fort Smith and the, the mill and all of that. And these are some of the individuals, um, you know, behind me that were involved. Um, White Sook or Sir Eaton um, Beck um, was involved. And Jacob Owens was the deputy marshal. Him and uh, Marshal Peavy were the two deputy marshals that were in charge of coming to um, Fort Smith or to um, Going Snake trial that day. Um, and so they knew that there was going to be some trouble, so they moved the, um, the, the, the trial from the courthouse 
um, over to what was called the Whitmire School at the time. And so they thought that they could have a little bit better handle on, um, you know, it was a, a smaller room, it was, um, um, you know, one entrance in and out. And so they thought they might have a little bit better handle if there were people um, that were going to show up because they knew there was going to be some, some trouble. They knew that Kesterson had went to Fort Smith and was trying to get the, the court over there involved. And uh, Jacob Owens, uh, one, of the one of the marshals that was sent, he was leading the posse, right? Leading yes. the posse? Yeah, Jacob Owens was leading the posse. And you can go to the next slide. And he, he had a little bit of like notoriety. He was generally seen as a good, competent marshal. And yes. He was, he has like a, he brought in some big outlaw, and I'm forgetting the name. Do you know? I don't remember. I should know this. He, he, was, he was a big deal and generally regarded as a good guy that was yeah. leading the posse. Even, by the, even a lot of the Cherokees at the time actually um, thought highly of, of Jacob Owens. And so, yeah, he was the, the marshal that was, um, that was leading this. And then behind me we have, you know, the, the 11 people that were killed that day. Now, there's a lot of controversy over who fired the first shot. This is something that um, we love to debate today. Um, the marshals have pretty much accepted and acknowledged the fact that they should have never been there in the first place. Um, a lot of people will say that it was, um, oh, his, it was the other photo, but that white setback was the one that actually stormed in and, um, and you know, fired the first shot. And so um, this is a list of the casualties uh, during the, the trial. I mean, we have Johnson Proctor, who is the uh, brother of Zeke Proctor. He actually gets shot and killed. He was the first one. They say when, uh, when White Sutbuck came in that he was the one that grabbed the shotgun, and then it went off, and he was, uh, he was killed. Um, Andy Pallone, and then Moses Alberti, who was also a judge um, in the Cherokee Nation. And then we've got um, Beck members who were um, White, um, White Sutbuck actually doesn't get killed but um, Black Sut Beck and William Beck and Samuel Beck. Um, these were all family members that were part of the posse um, that was sent there to arrest Zeke. So once again, you should never put family members on a, um, you know, on a posse to go in a, and arrest somebody because they obviously have a, you know, a vested interest in not seeking justice perhaps, but maybe just revenge on, um, on Proctor at that time. And I, I remember I did kind of like a point by point of different uh, sources of like, the events that happened going in. So I can kind of remember Johnson grabs a shotgun. So it's a double barrel shotgun. Johnson catches the first round in the chest. And then as the shotgun's coming down, the second round hits Zeke in the knee. So Zeke's in the middle of the room on trial. And so Zeke is kind of hobbled. And I think at that point when no one, like after that you get wild, you know, uh, adrenaline fueled stories of Everything went crazy. You know, all hell broke loose, basically. Oh, it really did. Yeah. The judge gets shot. I mean, I think there were there were actually more than they say. At least eleven people were actually injured. But you have uh, Judge Six Killer who was shot um, and injured. Um, I mean, there were numerous other. Um, you know, Zeke himself was was injured, and so there was a lot of people that um, Arch Scraper, who is after all of this happens. So we have a, a gunfight that happens, and a lot of people will always um, talk about maybe the fight at the OK Corral. I think three people were killed during that, but it always gets a lot of notoriety um, in the Old West as far as um, gunfights. But this is actually, again, you know, the largest loss of life for the, the U.S. Marshal Service. But this gunfight goes on for quite a while, for about 15 to 20 minutes. And when you read a lot of the descriptions of this, you know, they talk about just how much smoke filled the courtroom. Um, and people were just, there were about 30 people they said outside who were Proctor um, supporters. And then you have about um, 10 to 12 people that show up that are with the, the marshals. Um, some, I mean, there, there's Beck family members there as well. There's other Beck family members we know that are, that are there outside that aren't part of the posse. But um, yeah, they say it lasted anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes at the gunfight, and the courtroom was just filled with, with smoke. And so um, a lot of injuries. Um, Arch Scraper, they ended up um, reconvening the next day. So they take a lot of the, um, the injured and, and dead over to the Whitmire plantation, uh, over to their home. And um, they ended up reconvening the next day. A very short um, um, deliberation, and Zeke was actually acquitted of, um, of the, the killing of, of Polly Beck. Yeah, I think, they, uh, I think they probably just wanted to get out of there before something else happened. Like, I it's mean, pretty... we get asked a lot, you know, why, when it reconvened so quickly, how, how were they so quick to, to, acquit, um, to acquit Proctor? And I think really 
after the marshals, you know, storming in and the way everything kind of went down, I think people were just ready to get the trial over. And um, yeah, he was he was quickly acquitted. There's a really good uh, article. I think Elias Boudinot, he, uh, the son, the younger Elias Boudinot, was writing for a Cherokee paper at the time, and he was on the scene. I want to say within 45 minutes of the shootout. And he's got a really good description of uh, just what happened. He said there's bodies lying with cowboy hats over their, with their hats over their faces. And he said there's broken bodies of a once true and loved friend. And he's a very good writer. And so it's just really like, I wish I'd brought it to read. <laughs> yeah, there's a number of interviews as well that, um, you know, describe the events that day. Um, I think it was Eli Whitmire, I think, or one of his kids yeah. um, that had done a lengthy I think it's in the Indian Pioneer Papers, um, you know, after that. But, yeah, they have a, a lot of descriptions out there on, on what went down that day. And, and Marshall Owens didn't pass away right away. He yeah. passed later from his widow. When Marshall Owens was shot and killed, he actually didn't. He wasn't killed immediately. He, I think he passed away the next day um, from his injuries. And so uh, PV was injured, but he um, survived his injuries, Deputy Marshal PV. Um, and then the aftermath, really what happens is there are arrest warrants that are sworn out by, so the federal government wants to, they have arrest warrants out for Zeke and pretty much everybody that was involved in the trial that was there on the Cherokee side of things. Well, Lewis Downing, here's a, he's the principal chief at the time, he turns around and um, what they do is they issue warrants um, for arrest for all the uh, marshals that were there and um, any of the posse members or anybody that was there accompanying the Becks. And so, um, so yeah, there were, this takes about 12 months to 18 months before all of this is actually resolved. And um, there's, the president gets involved, the president of the United States has to get involved. And so everybody's um, got arrest warrants, you know, sworn out for each other. And finally, everybody is pretty much granted amnesty and um, they're finally, no charges are going to be filed. Everything's kind of dropped. I talked to Jack Baker about this, and he had a really good... It's something that I just started using in my, like, everyday speech. And he's, uh, I asked him, I was like, well, what did Zeke do after everything went down? Everybody's looking for him. And he goes, well, I think he, uh, he did what we call... He went on scout. You know, basically going into hiding. And so yeah. the, the marshals all, all over the Cherokee Nation in that time. So all that time passes, but they're, you know, they're not being calm about it. They're still, you know, trying to bring people in, right? Oh, Yeah. Um, and Zeke, ironically enough, he ends up becoming a deputy U.S. marshal out of the same court there in Fort Smith. I think it's in the 18, um, late 1880s, I think is when he um, is actually sworn in as a deputy U.S. marshal. So um, you'll see a lot of that. You'll often see even people that were criminals that will later become deputy U.S. marshals um, out of the court. So yeah, there was a huge investigation that was done and it was found that the marshals were the ones that were at fault. Um, they should have never been there in the first place. Um, they had to actually kick it to the Indian agent up in um, um, Kansas because uh, the Arkansas, they couldn't really sort it out. There was a lot of bias involved as well. Um, again, Judge Story was involved with this and he was a, a pretty crooked judge at the time. And so, um, so yeah, they finally kicked it over to um, the Indian agent over in Kansas to write a report and um, it was found that the marshal should have never been there in the first place because Kesterson was considered a political citizen of the Cherokee Nation. And so, yeah, they should have, um, should have never been there and been involved. It's just an issue of not respecting our sovereignty. Just, exactly. Just missing it. And this was a, um, you know, a lot of people will talk about McGirt and everything today, but really there's so many um, comparisons as to how it was functioning back then as to how... I guess it could possibly function, which McGirt's a whole other issue, and it's really confusing for me as well, so we won't get into all that. But, um, you know, any crimes, again, that were committed, we have, we have marshals here. And once the, the railroads come through, so in the Treaty of 1866, we also have to allow railroads to start coming through the Cherokee Nation and Indian Territory. And this poses a, a huge problem. We have what we call an intruder problem. Um, there were, you know, when the railroads came in, they weren't just take, taking in the section of the railroad. It was sometimes miles on each side of it. And, um, you know, to be here in Indian Territory at that time, prior to Oklahoma statehood, you either had to be a citizen of one of the tribal nations or married to one of the citizens, or you had to have a permit from the federal government. Um, you know, there's a lot of, um, there was a lot of crimes, even like uh, Judge Parker, you know, with um, people that were illegally here in the territory. So you'll see a lot of those court cases as well. But um, yeah, you had to have a reason to be here in Indian Territory, but that wasn't 
that wasn't the, the case. There was, when you look statistically, I think even out in the Chickasaw Nation, it was around 15 to 1 of intruders to, um, to actual tribal citizens that lived out there. And it was supposed to be the marshal's job to come in and remove these intruders, and more often, you know, it didn't, you know, I guess I'm getting into opinions here, but they didn't do much of a good job, really. Yeah, and even um, Judge Parker, in one of his final interviews in the 1890s, you know, he pretty much pitched the blame because they use all the lawlessness that's going on here in Indian Territory as one of the reasons to push for statehood, even. And it's um, even Parker places the blame on the federal government and you know its policy with natives as to why there's an, an intruder problem here in Indian Territory. A lot of people refer to this as Outlaw's Paradise over here. You had a lot of people that were. Um, from the states that were um, committing crimes in the states and running over into Indian Territory trying to hide out. You also had people coming here committing crimes and then running back across the border over into Arkansas or Texas or wherever. Um, you know, so we didn't have that jurisdiction to be able to go over and arrest them once they had left Indian Territory. So this is why you'll see so many um, tribal lawmen are also cross-deputized as Deputy U.S. Marshals at this time as well. You see a lot of, uh, you look at the newspapers at the time, and there's a lot of, like, salacious headlines. That's where you get that term, the hell on the border. They're really trying to make it seem like a just lawless Indians going wild when it's really just a deluge of intruders coming in and just disrupting not just our ways of life, our land, just how we operate day to day, but it's our fault, you know. It's yeah. Yeah, an ongoing issue. <laughs> I know. A lot of people, yeah. Again, when you look at the statistics even of people who were hung over at Fort Smith, um, it's about evenly divided between natives, African Americans, and then um, just whites. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was one of those things that Parker, and I won't get into Parker too much, Judge Parker. He gets a kind of a bad reputation, but he was actually ahead of his time in a lot of ways. I mean, he was definitely a man of his time. But he was one of the first to employ an Afri African American um, bailiff in his courtroom. He was a big supporter of women's rights. Um, he was a big supporter of Native rights, and he he put the blame. He laid the blame on the you know the, the feet of the U.S. government and said it was their fault that Indian Territory had become such a um, you know a law like so much lawlessness was here. And so um, you know, I mean, there's definitely policies of his that I disagree with, but there's a lot of it that. He was a little bit ahead of his time. And a lot of it is also where you get this, Zeke gets this reputation as this, like, mad outlaw. Like, people spread rumors that he killed all those people himself when he, you know, probably could barely stand the pain of being shot in the knee immediately. And just, and this builds up a lot of those rumors. He becomes this big outlaw figure to people through newspapers and then a lot of the books and things that are printed in the early 1900s, you know. Oh, yeah, and I wore my Ned shirt today because he often gets associated with Ned Christie, although the two have very different stories. Um, they both definitely had run-ins with the, the U.S. Marshals over in Fort Smith, but um, their stories are completely different. But you will often see these two Cherokee men um, kind of lumped together as these outlaws or patriots. You know, what, what are they? Are they good guys or are they bad guys? And so... Um, yeah, Zeke was one of those other Cherokee men that was also accused of, you know, multiple crimes and killing all these people. I think they, some people will even say he's the only individual that the U.S. government ever had a tr treaty with, one individual. Um, so there's a lot of fabrication on, on a lot of that. When you get into really talking about that, the only person we know for sure that he ever actually killed was Polly. And he admitted to it and turned himself in. And I remember I asked, I don't think it was you, but I asked a historian about that. And I was like, really? He only killed one person? They go, well, you know, sometimes that's a lot of paperwork. <laughs> so, so we don't really know. But the only thing we really know is that for sure he only killed one person, for sure. I think just kind of reading some of the accounts on him, maybe he was a little bit hot-headed or something. But yeah, as far as I know, he was only ever... Um, had only ever killed that one person, and that was that was Polly Beck. And as Rory said, he immediately uh, turned himself in um, for that uh, once he once he killed her. So yeah, we tried to kind of break down a little bit of Going Snake. Um, are there any questions from the audience pertaining to this to this history? Uh, 
Um, she asked if Judge Parker was related to any of the Parkers in Texas. Um, to my knowledge, no. He was actually from Missouri, and so he was um, appointed to um, by Grant. Yeah, it was President Grant that had appointed him, but to my knowledge, I don't think he's associated with. And a lot of people will confuse him with Judge Roy Bean out of Texas, um, who was a, a pretty crooked judge as well, and so um, somehow he gets confused with him. I think we went over it, but a lot of just this was treated in the press like a big, huge event. And so it was like, kind of like a, to America, it almost felt like an, an embarrassment that these, that these Indians out in Indian territory were able to take down these marshals. And so that's kind of how the story was presented. And so it was, and that's kind of how Judge Parker came in, right? They wanted somebody to come in and really take control of what they saw as these horrible, out of control issues. Exactly. Any other questions about Going Snake or Outlaws or lawmen, go ahead. Um, how much do you think of these histories uh, as border like especially in Cherokee Nation So she asked about, um, you know, the borderlands as far as the histories and the different, so like the different tribal nations being next to basically the United States. So Fort Smith, um, you know, this was the westernmost part of the United States at one point. And, um, you know, there was, uh, when it was first established, it was because of the Cherokees and the Osages that were, that were constantly um, fighting with each other. But it gets the nickname, Rory mentioned it a while ago, Hell on the Border. Um, you know, if, if you've ever been to the Fort Smith National Historic Site, um, I do always encourage people to go there, not just because I used to work there, but it's actually got a very fascinating history. Um, and a lot of people don't realize, like, when you walk into that building, it's all connected to here, to Cherokee Nation, to Indian Territory, and the history here. And But it got its nickname because the conditions in that jail were so bad. Because it's in an army, it's in an old army barracks building is where the courtroom was established. And it's... Um, uh, there would be about 50 men in a very small room. There was no running water. There was no, you know, heat or air. Um, they were sleeping on, you know, straw-filled, um, you know, sleeping bags. And so it was, um, there was a lot of men that died in that jail, and that's how it got its nickname, uh, Hell on the Border. But there was, yeah, I mean, it was Fort Smith, even the, the, whenever the, the city starts to grow, it's really the citizens of Fort Smith who are actually asking you know, for the, for the uh, military to stay there because they're worried about the natives out here you know, over in, in Indian Territory. When, um, when you look at our school systems, our government, um, we were much more, I hate to use the term civilized, but we were a lot more, we had a lot more going on here in the Cherokee Nation. There were people from Arkansas that were sending their kids here um, to go to school. Um, and so, yeah, we had, um, I felt like we had a lot more control over our government and schools and, and people than a lot of people over there that did. There's a, there's a full report that had the, uh, the president's report on Going Snake. And you see the report from uh, the Cherokee uh, sheriff that was in the area. And it looks like it was written by a scholar, you know, the, just the language that's used. And then you get to the marshal's account, and it's like, three word sentences and yeah. and very exaggerated and not quite believable and so there was there is a difference in education going from your Cherokees here to people you know Arkansas we had much higher literacy rates and, and all of that than any of our neighbors Um, she asked if any of the deputy marshals that were involved in Going Snake were part of, um, like, any of the Texas Rangers. Um, I'm not sure if they were, but I do know. I mean, there definitely were marshals that were um, that were involved, like, down in Texas. I mean, I know Bass Reeves even goes down into Texas. He's, he's like, I forget exactly what he's head of. Um, but I know that he's down in Texas at some point. Um, I mean, we do have... Like Sam Six Killer, he was like head of the United States Indian Police at one point. And so, yeah, you'll see a lot of, um, but they're not specifically involved with, with Going Snake. But um, Sam Six Killer, who was, a, um, you know, one of our, the first Thai sheriff here in the Cherokee Nation. If you go down to our prison museum, you can um, see a lot of information on him. 
Um, he's, he was shot and killed um, in Muskogee, but he, uh, yeah, he definitely made a name for himself. He was, even the railroads, like he was in charge of a lot of, a lot of that, police and the railroads, and, and so yeah, we have some tribal lawmen that did a lot of great things, and they definitely deserve more attention. I have a question, Catherine. There was a, uh, I remember one of the deputies was a young man, like real young. And isn't there like a, a headstone out there that says, there was like a report, you know what I'm talking about? It's something along the lines of, they killed our baby. It was something like that. It's a real young man. Do you know what I'm talking about? Is it Riley Woods? I, that sounds right, Riley yeah, Woods. I, yeah, Riley Woods, actually his headstone was, was covered up there for a few years. And I was like, I know he's buried out here. And I know somebody didn't take this headstone. And so we went out there and we uncovered it. And, um, and yeah, we need to get that reset. But um, yeah, I think he, because he wasn't from here. He was, but he was buried not too far from where Going Snake, um, where all of that went down. Any other questions? No, you guys are a quiet audience. No questions over here? You ladies are quiet. <laughs> all right, well, I guess that concludes our program on Going Snake. And if you guys have any additional questions, we will be around um, afterwards if you want to um, ask us any, any questions that you don't want to do publicly. <laughs> so, all right, thank you all. What do?